You're listening to Make It, a podcast by Bonsai Creative that helps aspiring professionals in film get where they're going faster by dissecting the advice, knowledge, and insights of professional creatives in the film industry. I'm your host, Chris Barkley, and with me today is my good friend and Make It podcast co-host, Nicholas Bugs. Hello, hello, Chris here with another episode of the Make It Podcast, and this is Any Talk Week, and that means I have my good friend and co-founder with me, Nicholas Bugs. Nick, say hello. Hello, hello, hello. It's good to be back, man. It feels like forever now. Yeah, it is good to be back, and as always, there's a lot going on in the world of indie film, and in the world of film in general, it seems like every day something is happening. That yeah. could not, that is, it's not just like, oh, the Oscars and oh, these awards. And no, I mean, things are happening at a macro scale that have the power to disrupt everything. A lot of things. And I right. think like and the last any talk we talked to, we like sprinkled in a thought about NFTs, non fungible tokens. That has the power to up in things, right? Because what happens when someone writes a movie about making an NFT only to be sold as an NFT. Very meta. Right. And, <laughs> and, and probably already on the way. Right. Right. And so one of the things we want to talk about today is something that kind of slid, maybe intentionally, I'm not being conspiratorial, but maybe, maybe intentionally slid under the radar and that was his case with Google versus Oracle over the Android software that Google just, they just, they didn't take the whole piece. They took a little piece. piece. They took Come a little on. Piece. You got, they take the you whole gotta thing. Play, you got to play the Oreos. <laughs> share, share one of them. Share one of the <laughs> right. Oreos for the common yeah. good, of course. That's right. Yeah. It has nothing to do with, with us, Google. I'm going to take that cookie. I'm going to open that up. I'm going to share that cream with people. Right. Well, that I'm was, not really going to share it. I don't I'm going to sell yeah. it. Yeah, I'm going to sell that cream. <laughs> right. I'm going to lick it first. <laughs> right. I know what it's like. Yeah, I'm going to sell it. Right, for billions of dollars. For, yeah, and it's, it's, it's weird that, you know, Google being one of the most valuable companies in the world, if not, uh, they're either one or two or three in terms of market cap. You're talking about one of the biggest companies in the world, Oracle. You know, the thing about Oracle is, is, they're sort of like this legacy behemoth that continues to sort of uh, chug forward, but but actually is kind of, I think, behind technologically. And um, but they had a right. I think they had. I think I think they were on the right path in this case. I think they had a good case. I think they had a good argument. Hey, we own this piece of Android software technology. And we license it. It's a billion dollar revenue stream for us. Yep. You can't just take it for the public good. Well, the courts disagreed. Google won six six to two in, in the judgment. And this could be ominous for filmmakers and creatives going forward. We mentioned NFTs. There are all sorts of digital uh there's all sorts of digital creative being made. Think about all the movies that are animated, shows that are animated. Now, this isn't happening tomorrow, but there's an implication that down the line, an argument could be made. Hey, if your movie was 95 percent software and 5 percent human, you know, do you have the right to that? And can I use it? Can I make an Avengers movie if I want to? Ooh, I don't know. Can I make the next um, Disney film, princess film? Maybe I want to make my own version of of Aladdin or Rapunzel. Is it yeah, Rapunzel? Yeah, and I, and I hear you, and I think that you know, there's for me, I'm trying to tie it together, right? I think there's yes, you know, I appreciate you looking ten years out, right? Like, what, like if this blows up, what could it snowball into? Yes. Right? So, but if I'm looking six months out to five years out, maybe two years out, I'm thinking about what you said earlier about NFTs. 
Mm-hmm. You know, so I think about, you know, so what Google did was they didn't take all of it, right? They didn't take all of Avengers. They didn't take all of Aladdin, right? They, they took a little piece, right? They took a little piece. So what does that piece mean? So I think about like, well, what if I just took the fight scene, right? At the end of Avengers, right? It's, end game. It's a big piece. But, but, you know, but not the whole thing. But I just took the part where all the female heroes yeah. stood up, right? And they all right. came together like that. And I just took that little piece and I said, I'm going to sell that as an NFT, right? Yeah. Because I didn't take the whole thing. Right. Right. So for the creative good... I needed this piece to be out there in the world. So I took that piece and somebody was like, nah, you just infringed on my copyright, dude. Like you can't take that. That's my movie. But like, what? but I didn't take the whole movie and, and Google versus Oracle said yeah. I could do it. And yeah. I think that's the type of stuff we start to look at is like, what constitutes a small enough piece of the pie that it's worthy of, literally like unprecedented and you know copying i can just copy it replicate it and well th- that's my my point is, is that all pieces aren't created equal either you right know, there's there's the piece that makes the whole thing work and then there's the stuff around it right so to your point using using your example if i take the fight scene from end game you know at the end if i actually just take thanos snapping that's a big, that's a big piece. That's kind of like the climax. That's kind of like the point. So all the pieces of that film are not created equal. Right. So I think Google was pretty specific about what piece they took and why they were going to take it. Right. What, what amazes me and what people may not know is that this is how this industry sort of runs. It runs through the series of, of, and when I mean industry, I mean the the software industry and technology industry. It it sort of runs through a series of licensing deals, right? And there are companies like Nokia and Siemens who have you know giant revenue streams simply based on all the telephony um, technology they own and license out. So they're all in jeopardy now. They're probably all shaking in their boots because. Because Google can come in and bludgeon you. Apple does this all the time. They do this all the time. They go out. You come up with some technology. You're a five to fifty million dollar company, and they'll come in and they'll take it from you. And then they'll say, "Okay, well, we'll pay you off." Or you know what? Better yet, we'll just acquire you. Or maybe you'll go to court, and we'll bleed you dry in court through appeals process. And you won't make it as a company and the threat, the theft will be complete. Right. <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have stolen from you with the, and Cause the thing about a corporation is there's nobody to get mad at individually. You're kind of like, Oh, so, so when companies are this big, they have the power to bludgeon you a little bit when you have a piece of technology. So I think it's, it's ominous obviously for software companies and for those in technology Right now, the judge, and, and the good thing about this judge is, is that he mentioned this is only pertaining to software. But the mistake that he made in that statement is not f- perhaps not understanding the broadness of the word software. Software, right. That's a broad yeah. word. It's not as specific. And again, it amazes me, didn't make the news. And I know a lot's going on in the world. I don't want to make light of that. There is a lot going on in the world. We got Derek Chauvin's trial coming to a close. We got we got another shooting, two or three or four happening. Um, there are uh, stories that are, are going to make, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. I understand it. But this is Google. This is one of the biggest companies, you know, in the world. And you really had to search for this story. And it, but it showed up in these entertainment rags. So there's something behind that. Something they're not writing into the story that they understand is possible. Because that's, well, that's how it works. I think the bottom line is, is that Google admitted to what they did. 
<laughs> but that's, that's the best know, part about it. <laughs> exactly. They're like we're gonna, but we're still gonna defend it. Like you, you're gonna come after us. Well, we're gonna have to defend it. And you know what's the best part about it? Actually, that I think about is like they got sued, so they had to fight, right? I mean, yes. you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna fight. Yeah. What if they never thought they would win? You know, it's like that, like like that um, Dave Chappelle, right? When he was like, "Yeah, I was riding in the car with my buddy." Right. With a with white guy, you know, and he's speeding, you know, and he's like, dude, what are you doing? You can't be speeding. You know, they get pulled over and Dave Chappelle, he's, he's all freaked out. Right. Yeah. And the officer comes to the to the window and then looks at the guy. I was like, do you realize he was speeding? He was like, um, I didn't know I couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what? That's not an argument like like what? Is, and it's funny because watching this, it's like Google was like, well, we got to fight it because you're suing us. And we're going to be like, yeah, we copied it because it was there. And like we knew the code. Like, why make it if we don't have to? It's just so it's, it was like, so hard. And, and there's so many resources <laughs> we'd have to expend if this did not exist. It's, but and, it's there. <laughs> and, and we need to. Yeah, we need to, to, to do this. By the way, quick aside, yeah. killing them softly. One of the best stand-ups of all time. Right, of course. That's one of the best of stand-ups of all time. <laughs> uh, it is in the Hall of Fame. They're just, it's just, it's its like an album that just has hit after hit. It's like the miseducation of Lauryn Hill. Lauryn it's like Hill. Yeah. one after the other, after just a banger. And they all have like meaning beneath the joke. And it's like, oh, quality. This guy's, yeah. this guy's killing me. Now, I didn't know I couldn't do that is my version of I'm just as surprised as you are. As you are. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love that's my favorite excuse. Yeah. Favorite excuse. And it works on anything. If I fart, I'm just as surprised as you are. <laughs> right. And everyone's like, oh, okay. All right. Good. Gotcha, You're in bed Chris. with another woman. Good. Honey, I'm just as surprised as you are. <laughs> 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 I guess that I guess that would be a little bit better than I didn't know I couldn't do that. <laughs> right, right, right. And the uh, the funny thing is that people hear you say it all the time, then they start repeating it. And it works against you. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. You know, you, you, you put you buy some food, you put your name on it, make sure your roommates or somebody doesn't eat it. Mm. And then they're eating it, and then you're like, "What's going, what, dude?" I'm just as surprised, just as, surprised as you are. As you are. <laughs> <laughs> Look down at your name. Whoa. <laughs> when did that get there? That's a so, beat down. Anyway, sorry. I, 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 yeah. I love it. My now I'm not b- trying to be conspiratorial, Chris, on this in this conversation. I've said that twice now. Yes. But I also, you know, I I coddle conspiratorial Chris. I, I, I love on him. I nurture him. And because I am, I, I do have a curious mind. I do like to read through these things and I do like to understand the history of things. And because of that, I have this thought that maybe the reason why it's not very important outside of the fact that it's tech and it could be boring, let's say, and there's a lot going on in the world, which are the obvious reasons, could also be that there's this group called Infoists that. Um, are like Malthusians. They're in power all over the globe, and you don't know who they are. If you don't know what a Malthusian is, go look up Malthus. So, the Google it. <laughs> so, they're all over the world, and they're in power everywhere, and they believe that all information, personal or otherwise, should be free and open to everyone at all times for any reason. And IP and copyright should just go away, that they're actually a hindrance to progress. Nick, what do you think about that? Do you think IP and copyright philosophically in a world like we have today, 5G, high speed Internet, quick information, global society, is it a hindrance to progress? No, I think it protects one's ability to you know, monetize their innovation. You know, uh, because it, it's not just about the big corporations, but what if the individual creates something, mm-hmm. right? Without that protection, then the corporation would basically subsume through power and resources all innovation, right? Yeah. It's like you were saying earlier about being bludgeoned by the legal side of things, right? Like the average Joe who creates something and doesn't have the ability to patent or copyright, 
it might as you might as well just give it to them. Like it's almost like you know, in in some governments of the world, right, where the you know the the government owns everything. Yeah. yeah. Right. Where it's like they just own everything. China. So it's like, well, you might as well. Yeah. There you go. Might as well give it up. Right. Just might as well. All right. I came up with the idea. I'm screw it. Here, take it. And you're gonna take it from me anyway. So I think that it it prevents the ability for some democratization of ideas and innovation and then the monetization of those ideas. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I think even to our point, you know, as it pertains to creative and making creative, digital creative yeah. of any kind, but especially film, it's really expensive. It requires investment dollars from banks, from VCs, from angels. Why would anyone invest in IP ever again? Why would anyone make spend money on a sequel or a spinoff ever again if anyone could make it and anyone had access to the technology and the underlying inventions that made those things possible? You know, so I think that without some type of ownership and control over a thing, you, you don't get the outcome you want as the consumer. Meaning, I would much rather have a film from Ryan Johnson or Ryan Coogler than to have a film from, you know, the guy who, who directed the mighty ducks. I don't know. Like, like it's just like, in, no, no, no shade. Right. Mighty ducks. I right. No it. shade, no shade, but, but, but it's not the same, right? <laughs> like, like I want, I, I'm, I'm a guy who brags and, and, and sort of gushes all over Chris Nolan. I want people to give Chris Nolan money because he makes things that make the world a better place. And he pushes our standards higher. Mm-hmm. He right. creates a new bar for everybody to get to in those high standards, but get high standards. And then we just keep getting better and better creative, which is something we're going to talk about here in a minute, potentially as well. Like what good creative can do for you. So anyway, that's, that's my two cents on it. Just kind of like, Yeah, we don't want to lose those rights for a lot of reasons, but also because those rights, for the most part, are in the incapable hands. Yeah, especially if they're the original inventor of the thing. Right. Like they had the toil to do it, you know, like they put in the toil, the work and the commitment to do it. They should own it and then they should be able to proliferate ideas from it that are going to be better than someone who's a second hander. Yeah. And that's the brand quality you're talking about there, you know, and, and creating expectations, setting expectations and maintaining those expectations with your audience or your consumer, right? When that's taken away from you and someone else, like you said, some second hand person gets to come in and, yeah. you know, duplicate or replicate, or let's say make a, uh, a new version of your creative. It's just not the same anymore. No, right. It, it'll die right where it, it, it is. Will- it really, that's the fear. Like, yeah, like having unique art from great artists dies. Oh, I hate it. So speaking of sequels, by the way, Netflix just spent four hundred and sixty eight million million dollars. Right. Was it? Oh, oh, is that all? Right. Oh, is that all? Yeah. <laughs> For the two sequels to Knives Out and. All these naysayers have come out of the woodwork, say, oh, it doesn't make economic sense. It's not, you know, it's not, uh, you know, the math just doesn't work. This is this is we work all over again. You know, where we we work documentary on Hulu, by the way. Check that out. This idea of like paying thirty dollars, paying forty dollars a square foot for property that's worth thirty dollars a square foot and then trying to sell it back to me and you for fifty dollars right foot. right <laughs> that dog don't hunt right <laughs> <laughs> that's, so, so that's what they're accusing Netflix of now it, it matters that the people that are naysaying are the people who lost the bidding war for the sequels Apple Amazon HBO Max etc now I know you said there's this sequels wasn't there talk about a series? I don't remember. I don't remember. Now they're, but they're set to shoot in Greece, and we mentioned Greece is a great place to shoot with subsidies, I think, on an indie talk a year ago, by the way. Call mm-hmm. back. And they're shooting in Greece this fall, the sequel. Mm-hmm. 
It's going down. It's 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 going to happen. Yeah, so. I, I got to look it up. I could have sworn that that was the talk. Like it was like because it would be great, you know, if you if you thought about it, like following that detective, you know, around again for like. Isn't it based on an Agatha Christie detective? <sighs> like, which is a series, right? Yeah, I gotta find oh, no, out. Someone about this. on the internet's gonna kill me because I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. But it, I thought it was. I thought Daniel Craig's character was based on a on an Agatha Christie detective, and I thought that was a series. But maybe that's what you're thinking of, or maybe that's why they would consider it a potential series. The movie cost forty five million dollars to make. To this date, it's made three hundred and eleven million dollars worldwide. Now, right. Keep in mind, it came out the end of 2019, so I think it would have made even more money had the the Rona not hit in early 2020. So it made that money through the Rona as well. And do you have a sense, Nick, of whether Netflix is going to win or lose or whether this is smart or dumb? Are you on the side of the Apple's and Amazon's and HBO Max's or, or are you on the, on uh, Reed Hastings side on this one? Uh, see, it's, it's difficult. I think that um, with this, series or this these sequels it's, it's kind of hard to say that netflix could lose just because their bank account <laughs> is so deep right like we can't say that like what's the 400 million you know like is, is that really going to hurt them so like the, on that side so the other thing is the reason why knives out did so well is because it singularly was a fantastic movie, right? Mm -hmm. That leveraged audiences from the ages of 18 to 98. Do you know what I said about it when it came out? I said it's this generation's Princess Bride. Yeah, I would say possibly, but the only difference with this one is that the, the actors in Knives Out, the age range... Right. And the significance of those actors at their prime. That's a great point. Was something that every, almost every demographic age range could connect with. Well, it had, well, Princess Bride had uh, Peter, uh, the guy who read, oh my God, now, now I'm really going to get killed because this is an obvious one, but the, grandpa, the grandfather. Right. He, right. He's been in 100,000 things and I'm having a brain fart, but yeah. Columbo. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, so maybe, right. It's Fred Savage being, you know, the young, right. hot young right. kid at the time, wonder years. Exactly. So maybe so. So maybe you're right. Right. Billy Crystal, you know, mm. somewhere in the middle of that. But I think that there's, so maybe it, maybe you're right on that. Right. Because it, it leveraged a lot of different talents. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. But that's the thing with Knives Out. So the question is, is that in addition to the quality of the storytelling, and Daniel Craig's character, is that what they t intend to replicate with Knives Out 2? Right, because the problem right, because is, is there was no Princess Bride 2. It, exactly, know? but the, and that's the like, thing. So if they go you know, Knives Out 2, will they replicate everything that made this film phenomenal? My fear is that if they don't, suck. it could suck harder than, like, because like, now, we, now we know we're there to be tricked. By the way, Peter Falk. Now we know that was the grandfather. Yeah. Of Bride. Now we yeah. know we're going to be tricked. Like to your point, can we? But it's, an, but it's okay. Again, no, or I third think it's time even. No, no, I think it's okay because, like you said, so it's not. I don't think it was based off an Agatha Christie character, but it's in the Agatha Christie style, right? It's a detective story. Like people, we love those things. You can have a whole series about detective stories. It's fine, right? You want to know, like what? What is this? You know? Yeah. But that trick was very complicated. It was. It, this, it was, this wasn't it was nice. just, and it, and it worked. Sometimes the trick doesn't work, and it's like, uh, like even like the greatest detective movie of, of all time, in my opinion, or maybe of the last fifty years, thirty years, forty years, uh, Usual Suspects. Like e yeah. even even that one, there are some spaces where you're like, wait a second, how did it work? How did that work? How could, how could verbal be Kaiser at this mm -hmm. moment in the movie? How can in you be movie. both? How can you be both Kaiser and verbal at the same time here? 
right. they don't and and they don't give you that. You know, but, yeah, so they could, but enough but like, of it is, there's point, enough connective tissue there to make you believe it. But with right. knives out, it all. Right. So, so to your point, that's the thing is like, you know, why? Because they have to had the, they identify had the something. Comedy. Right. But you have they to the ability identify to something that, that is so complicated. Yeah. Right. But, right. But this is, but it's so complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the concern, right? Is that if you're going to try to do that again, not just a detective trying to figure something need, out with a bunch another, of pieces. They need, they need another, um, they need another tool to leverage like that. Like, like, you know, throwing up when you're lying, Princess Bride had Andre the Giant, but right. right. That's like a, you can't duplicate that. That that's yeah. a one of one. Right. So because yeah. he's Andre the Giant, there are all these things you can get away with to make the story fit. Like, yeah, if that guy's that big and has that cloak on, everybody's going to disperse. Right. Yeah. You don't have Andre the Giant and you just try to go in like your Mel Gibson and Braveheart. It's not going to work. Right. Yeah. But yeah, so you gotta have something. So we'll, right. So we'll see. OK, so the because, again, I don't know who the cast is going to be. Mm-hmm. Right. Because that film was about that family. It wasn't. Mm, the, the, they're true. not going to go again. Right. Like yeah, and grandpa's dead. Right. So it's a whole different story now. Well, so it's about the it's about the detective. So really, it's like, what kind of story can you create again where there's a massive cover up? Yes. Where the detective figures it out. So we'll see. You know, and, and I don't reason, even know if it's a I'm Knives Out sequel. It's not yeah. it's not a part two. It's the detective's story. I think it should be named something else. Right. Like, actually, I think you're spot on. Let's just see if you're right yeah. in a couple of months here, maybe six, six months a year. I think you're right. I think there's no way. I think, I, well, I think you go knives out so people know, but it becomes about Daniel Craig's character. Two and three is all about him. And they actually have the option to make a, a, a fourth one. Netflix optioned a fourth one for that money. Right. Well. Daniel Craig was like, so you it's going to be Daniel Craig going to different families. Yes. That's what it's going to be. Okay. Got right. it. We figured right. it out. He, yeah. And he can and, deal with some corporate stuff too. But the thing is, is like, you know, he it's funny because I think about it, Daniel Craig. I'm like, yeah, he's like, all right, if y'all don't want me to be Bond anymore, I need to find something else to be for the next 10 years. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's like, this is this is me. This is, I'd, this I'd is the love, new me. I love to have him on screen doing this. You know, it's better than sort of like the Mike Myers approach, which is, you know, I gave you Austin Powers and that money's going to feed me for the rest of my life and many, many generations after. So I'm done. Did you say many, many or many, many? Mini mini. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I'm with you. I think Netflix is going to win, but I think they're going to yeah. win for two other reasons. One, I think they're deeply invested in a theatrical run for both of these. Theaters work. The bottom line truth is, and what you're not going to hear through the media or these channels, it's like we love to see a train wreck. We show up for the train wreck. Yes. Like we, we, world, world star. Like, like we, we want to show up to see somebody get knocked out. And I don't know what it is. <laughs> oh, man, I feel like you just shouted it out. I just feel like well, you just yeah, literally yeah, just. Shut up. <laughs> so we love that. And we're, we want to see AMC and Regal and all. We want to see them um, on their knees. And it's so unfortunate because the reality is, is that the, those theater systems work. I'm a big proponent of it. Even though indie films don't get that run often when they do, even if it's a 20 theater run nationally, it pays so much more than going straight to streamer if you don't get a, um, a, a distribution deal directly with Apple or Amazon, but you get a services deal. It pays so much more. And your chance of getting a deal with those streamers that's lucrative goes exponentially through the roof if your 20 theater run goes well. Matter of fact, if you go 20 theaters and it does really well, you'll get 60. And if 60 does well, you'll get 100. Right. But just keeps, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a self, um, you know, generating, it's self generating marketing and growth and word of mouth marketing growth, which is the holy freaking grill, right? It is. That's where Knives Out did it, man. Yeah. Right. Word of mouth. It was just so good. Word of mouth. Exactly. So I think they're going to win because of that. And then I think they're also going to win because, now, there could be some term in the contract that, that licenses this out for, there, there could be like an end date. But in theory, they get to run this content on their streaming service in perpetuity. So 
again, there's, there was a saying when I, when, when me and you first got in the movie business, which is that every movie makes its money back. The question is, will it make it back in two years or 200? Right. <laughs> you kind of want to make yep. it back while you're still breathing, but Hey, you know, and that's where those jokes about, Hey, you know, your, your kids get the business and the operating agreement. They're going to, that's when all the money's going to roll in. They'll just get no right. money yeah. <laughs> from, from the movie you made uh, half a century ago. So, so yeah, I think they're going to win. Anyway, we talked about making quality content and also sort of that word of mouth generation. I wanted to give something to the audience word of mouth that could be valuable. Nick, uh, there are two programs right now for making short films and we've heard the rhetoric before short films aren't profitable and we might go on this topic in another indie talk for sure, but I want to make sure that we just give the announcement as to what these programs are. So can you, can you share with the audience these two programs for short films and short film directors that could pay off big time if the sh- shorts are great? Yeah. And I think this kind of gets back to, you know, like you said, some of our early talk tracks about content. Yes. You know, we, we've talked to you know a lot of filmmakers about, you know, short film content and we've heard them say that, you know, there, there's there's no money in it. There's no ROI, you know, in short films. And, you know, I think that's true, just like there's no ROI in feature indie films if you just let them sit around. Yeah. Right. Even your greatest indie film that's sitting on the shelf somewhere, there's no ROI because you didn't sell it. Right. You didn't get in front of people. You didn't level up. You didn't create, you know, leverage connections to do that kind of thing. So in ROI you know, doesn't us, have to be money. Exactly. And for us, you know, the ROI is it, it's tied to the greatness of the content. Right. Like we always say, if, if you're making great stuff, that's the first step. But then the second thing is, is that are you actually finding an audience for that great work? And it doesn't matter if it's short form or long form, if it's great and you find an audience for it then there's ROI. And like you said, the ROI could be that it's an accolade that you achieve from it that then gets you leveled up. It could get you seen by someone. Uh, You could get paid for it. You know, even if it's not a windfall, you know, a lot of these short films, you know, as long as it's not necessarily animation, it might cost, you know, what, five grand, 10 grand to make. And if you can make 10 grand or 20 grand on your five to 10 grand film, that's pretty darn good ROI better uh, return on investment than you get in just about any market that isn't Bitcoin. So exactly. So like yeah, there's, there's value great. there. And, and but back to what you're at, asking me, Lulu Wang, you know, she took her short film and, and was able to go to AFM with it. Right. And then meet someone who gave her the funding for her feature that was up for movie of the year and was great. Ex- and, and exactly. And, and that's the thing. So like, so right now, you ROI. know, I know of, yeah, I know of uh, two programs. So one is the Disney Launchpad, mm-hmm. and you know that one is still open. Uh, I think it's open until June 11th, and that's for you know short film um, writers, directors, okay. writer directors, and directors. Right, so you can get in on any of those uh, those titles. Do the shorts and have to be animated? No, oh, also- they don't. And this is this is a lab. You know, it's it's narrative. Right. And, you know, if you if you go look up, um, you know, the the Disney lab, then what you'll find out is like all the qualifications, but also the things that disqualify you. And it's interesting because like if you've had a narrative feature that's been uh, had a theatrical release, then you're disqualified. Mm. Right. So they're really looking at, you know, for folks that they can grow right through the lab so that they can either take part in the Disney, you know, ecosystem or that they can say that they had a part in developing. So there's a lot of, you know, requirements and then there's all the, the things that disqualify you. So yeah, it's, it's, I think it's an awesome one. If you think about it, like, you know, we, and I say we, but my family watches a lot of shorts on Disney, mm-hmm. right? It's a great way. Cause you know, all the Disney shorts, to be honest, are, are thoughtful, you know, the films with morals, you know, like there's something you want to teach someone in all of these shorts. Right. And it's great. You know, family with kids, like let's watch this five minute thing and we can learn a, a very important life lesson. 
And I think that they're going to capitalize on that. And I think, you know, once other folks start to see that Disney's doing this, we're going to see these things popping up all the time. Uh, and I say that, but, you know, Hulu also has one. So if then and Hulu have a short documentary lab. Now, their lab for 2021 is closed, mm. uh, but you can go check that out, too. It's if slash then and Hulu short documentary lab. And, you know, it's a partnership between the if then shorts and Hulu documentary films. So but here's another opportunity. Right. And, so and Disney's do doing narrative. Is this an annual thing? Yep, an annual thing. And, so and, I think and shorts have to be sort of socially impactful or the yeah, so I documentary think, style. Yeah. So the documentary one, and I'll just kind of read from a little bit here, just says that um so this one for the if then Hulu short documentary lab, this is the inaugural mm-hmm. uh lab. And then for the Disney launch pad, it's actually the second one. Mm-hmm. So these are relatively new and they are looking for, you know, diverse talent. And it says, you know, incubating strong voices who will be the next class of nonfiction storytellers. That's the documentary part. So they are looking for diversity and inclusion in this. Um, so they're looking for folks who can tell diverse stories, you know, have come from diverse backgrounds. And I think they are looking for folks, you know, not necessarily um, socially conscious, but I think it it is likely to have a a moral compass associated with these films, and that's just the two shorts ones. You know, we've already you know interviewed a filmmaker who was you know part of the uh, was it HBO All Access Directors Fellowship. So there. yeah, so there are labs and fellowships and internships and all these opportunities out there for filmmakers, you know, who want to get either be part of the studio ecosystem or at least, you know, I was mentioning to you earlier, Chris, that in an earlier conversation that we had with our buddy and, you know, award-winning director, Matki Dapp, you know, he said, you know, at this stage in my career, I just need someone to come in who's got a little bit more experience, expertise, and connections in the industry to just step in and bring me up, Mm -hmm. right? Just just grab me and bring me up to that next level because as we all know, you know, that next level, there's no back door, right? It's like, you got to get somebody who's got a key to the kingdom to let you in that kingdom. And I think that's what these opportunities do. So even if you don't yourself become part of the ecosystem, at least you've made a connection Right. To someone who has the experience, the expertise, the influence to level you up. And then you've made potentially a friend for life, you know, where you can leverage that connection later. So, yeah, there's there's lots of opportunities. And those that's just three that we were able to find in you know, short order. And I've written for people that have worked with with us, Nick, I've written several letters of recommendation for programs like this. Yeah. And so I'll just put it out there. I'm happy to write a letter re- or recommendation for any filmmaker that that makes sense for that's that's worked with us before. And you want to join these programs. Here's your opportunity to get a little free work out of me and, <laughs> and also go go do your thing. Uh, I want to end on this. Well, in the talk on this uh, in regards to what you just said, I think also a big part of it and why we bring these things up, one, to inform you, but two, it really makes a difference where you put your content, what stream you go through to get to your audiences, as you were talking about, Nick. Right. There's this idea that the manager of a Domino's pizza that's working 80 hours a week and is understaffed is working just as hard as Elon Musk. Same output, different streams of influence, different skill sets, and the difference is literally a hundred billion dollars, right? So going to Disney and putting your short there versus throwing your short on Vimeo, no shade on Vimeo, Vimeo is great, but that could be the difference between just having to make another short and, and staying where you are or leveling up to your point in it. Yep, for sure. And there's plenty of opportunities out there. You know, like I said, this is just three of them, mm-hmm. you know, so, you know, as an indie filmmaker, I think there's a great opportunity to reach out, you know, again, if, even if you don't want to become part of the ecosystem, leverage their leverage, you know, 
So get out there, see what's out there. Here's a couple. Like I said, the um, the, the Disney one still open until uh, June 11th. The Hulu one, um, I think that closed in March. Uh, this is the inaugural one. They might do it again next year. Uh, the HBO All Access. I want to say they've been doing that since at least 2016. Yep. Uh, and then have another class in 2021. So that continues. But yeah, get out there, check out these fellowships. There's some great opportunities out there. I love it. Nick, I love you. <laughs> and I love you too. Sir. <laughs> and it's been another great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Having these conversations and, and also putting some goodness out there for our audience, you know, to take action. You know, that's one thing that's really important to us is, you know, for our listeners to be able to take action on the things that we say and not just not just hear them. Yeah. Uh, so actionable content is what we're about. I love it. And if you want to take some action on our content, you can do that by reaching out to us at contact at bonsai.film. That's contact at B-O-N-S-A-I dot F-I-L-M. Email us complaints. Uh, you can email us uh, compliments. You can email us suggestions. You can email us reviews and thoughts. We love all of it. Bring it on. Yeah, referrals. Also, yeah. We'll take the referrals. We'll referrals, take those. Too. Referrals take those too. Uh, you can find us on social media at underscore Bonsai Creative on Instagram and on Twitter. If you go on Facebook, you can find us by just searching for Bonsai Creative and we'll come right up. If you want to reach out to me and Nick individually, which we also love, you can find me on Twitter at Flame in Your Heart. That's Flame in Your, you are heart. You can find Nick at Nicholas Bugs, much better handle than mine, much easier, much more aligned with who he is, <laughs> or at least what his name is. Uh, yeah, so right. you can find us, exactly, you can find us on Twitter there. And then last but certainly not least, if you love the Make It podcast and you love Nick and you love Chris, you think we're doing a good job and you want to keep us uh, uh, gainfully employed doing this and, and continuing forward with great podcast content, we need you to rate and review. Go to Apple Podcasts. Yep. It sounds stars, trite. Baby. It sounds old dated. It's not. It helps people find our podcast. It helps us move forward. And it helps uh, us help other filmmakers just like yourself. Go to Apple Podcasts. Take a second. Five stars, please. Take 10 seconds. Write one sentence. It would really mean the world to us. Uh, and it would be great. So, Nick, with that, will you drop the credo on us? Yeah, man. Always. So be better. Be creative. Be engaged. Thank you for listening. Nick, talk soon. Yeah, man. We'll do it again. Peace. Doses. You've been listening to the Make It Podcast. To find more information about this week's topics, including links to relevant blog posts, projects, and indie creatives, please visit our website at www.banzai.film. If you haven't already, you can join our podcast community on Apple Podcasts or the podcast app of your choice by searching for Make It, Bonsai Creative, and the show will pop right up. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at underscore Bonsai Creative and Facebook by searching for Bonsai Creative. And of course, if you're looking to take a big step towards your filmmaking success, go to www.bonsai.film and click on Book Us to schedule a free discovery meeting and needs assessment. You have everything to gain. Until next time, be better, be creative, be engaged, and thank you for listening. Prime Day is coming July 16th and 17th with epic deals exclusively for Prime members. You'll feel like you just won an award. Oh, wow, I didn't even prepare a speech. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank my family for always needing stuff. Uh, also, Sam, my delivery guy, for bringing all my awesome deals so fast. You're the man, Sam! Shop deals on electronics, home, and more this Prime Day, July 16th and 17th.